Um, good afternoon. Uh, this talk is pretty much about uh, trying to get all of the waterbug data that you guys um, can potentially have access to and to make some sort of sense from it. Um, uh, I've had a little bit of help um, putting together a lot of the slides and the interpretation tools that um, I, I use in this talk and that we use on the National Waterbug Blitz site um, from a chap called Greg McDonald, who runs a consultancy called um, Embrace Ecology, and he's been um, pivotal, pivotal as a sounding board, if you can mix metaphors that horribly, this early on in a talk, um, and has you know helped, helped with a lot of the stuff that we've put together. Um, the more I did this talk, um, I'm afraid originally I came up with the original title, which was this, and then as the talk went together, it got turned on its head somewhat. So it's actually more likely to be something along the lines of um, this, what about data analysis and monitoring design, which is all exactly the same words, but in a totally different order. And I guess the reason it's this way around is that before we look at, you know, how you put these things or uh, phrase them, I guess, in a monitoring design, what I want to do is to basically untangle the actual data for you chaps in the first instance. Um, the National Waterbug Blitz stuff, I, I sort of have to put up the um, the many and varied logos slide just so that people get a feel for how many people were involved in putting this together. It's not a one man band by any means. It's heaps and heaps of dudes from heaps and heaps of different organisations, all of whom have been extremely helpful in putting together the Blitz. Um, this talk starts with a whole bunch of assumptions. Uh, one of them is that you're interested in this sort of stuff. Um, we can probably rattle over that quite quickly. Um, the other is that you have a sort of at least a passing um, knowledge of some of the bugs and how we would use them when we're doing some form of environmental assessment. The, the pivotal, or sorry, the main thing that we tend to use them in is a thing called the signal score stuff. And what I'll do at the beginning of this talk, I guess, is, is to walk through how we turn a list of bugs into a um, set of red and green dots um, super fast, just so you've got a feel for what the context is. The numbers that I'm going to talk about in all the rest of this talk basically are um, rendered down um, uh, lists of bug presence absence. So at any one of those dots, usually in the red dots there, there'll be a, a smaller list of um, more tolerant critters than there would be in the green dots. The green dots would typically have, you know, a big long list of awesome beasties, many of whom um, would, you know, die at the slightest sniff of um, pollutants or sedimentation or, you know, unpleasantnesses in their streams. So that's that's basically what's happening in there. Um, uh, this is the Waterbug app, which is the, currently one of the best ways of getting the data into the database to actually get those sorts of outputs. But um, much of the data that we'll look at today is actually there scrounged from alternate sources because this stuff takes time to build up. What we've done is we've um, basically got a whole bunch of really, really useful and helpful people, things like the Victorian EPA, um, Melbourne Water, Waterwatch, and we've, we've gone and uh, borrowed all their old data and basically turned it into comparable um, data that will basically be the sort of thing that you can put alongside the stuff that you would enter if you had the, the Waterbug app and it's instantly comparable one with the other. And that's that's um, the whole purpose of this thing. Uh, like I was saying before, the way this thing works is this would be the sort of assemblage that you would expect at one of those red dots. This is more like the sort of assemblage you'd expect at one of those lovely green dots. You can see there's worlds of difference between the two sites. So those patterns are quite large. If you're using the Waterbug app, um, the data will already be um, of comparable uh, sampling efforts. So you'll, you know, you've gone in, you'll have used the National Waterbug Blitz methods, you'll have spent a, um, a, a sort of a known amount of effort on getting the bugs out, and your IDs will be confirmed through the process of, you know, submitting photos to myself and the team, and we'll have made sure that all your IDs are correct using this sort of setup here. This is a bunch of critters from Sandy Bay River Lake in Taz. The way we then take those lists of critters and we turn them into the scores, the sort of two-dimensional numbers, if you will, um, is to basically follow a, a whole bunch of observations that are, you know, quite long in the tooth now. Um, uh, Bruce Chessman's stuff, from the Signal 2, was sort of put out in 2003, and that was even the second or third iteration of the, the, the signal scores itself. Um, and what we've done is we've taken Bruce's stuff and we've um, modified it a little bit to add a, to, um, so that it matches up nicely with our, the taxonomic levels that we use. And, and what it does is it basically does this thing. It, it, different critters are of known tolerances, and so they tend to occur in sites that are known to be horrible or in sites that are known to be awesome. That's, that's, that's as, as complicated as it gets. So in the terms of when you're generating a signal score, uh, if you can imagine the green top left of the screen is an awesome site, it would have things like the Dobson fly larva, which is up there. Um, whereas, you know, a, a nasty, uh, festy urban site might just have worms and that will score a one. To get yourself a signal score for a site, you simply average the scores that all of the taxa that you find at that site have. So it's a really, really simple 
a um, little bit of maths. Um, we can make it slightly more complicated by using what we call a weighted version. And that's basically a, a thing where if you have, you know, 50 of one critter and only two of the other, then you assume that the, the, the fact that there's 50 of one and that there's only two of the others is indicative of the site as well as the fact that they're different animals. Um, and what that does is it means that if you have um, one wonderful stonefly, you know, let's go up in an alpine area and gets washed down the stream and happens to find itself one afternoon in your tray in the middle of urban Melbourne, um, it's has the potential to totally and utterly ruin your scoring, um, dragging it you know, up way above what it would be worth. A weighted score um, would basically give all the animals that are there in any abundance a greater dominance in their contribution to the end average. Um, and so what it does is it down weights the um, influence of those ring-ins or rares, strange things. So when, when I'm using these scores, I tend to prefer a weighted, but you always get a little bit of information in the fact that if you see that there's a difference between a, a standard signal score and a weighted signal score, you've got this information that there are some critters in there that are probably rares or interestings, um, I guess. So every little variability, bit of variability is information, I guess is the way to think of that. So what is it that you're doing when you're assessing a site? So this is a whole bunch of different um, bands, I guess, that we have for the various states, all of which um, have data for the National Water Bug Blitz. You chaps um, feature in that second column. If you're from Victoria, if you've rung in from elsewhere, you'll have to find your own column. I'm going to concentrate a little bit on the Victorian stuff here. And you'll notice if you sort of spend a little bit of quality time with this um, slide that one of the first things that's obvious is that, that top line of green dots all have vastly different ranges and that in Tasmania and Victoria, for example, um, the, the green band is somewhere between, you know, something in six up to something at, say, seven or ten in Tasmania. Um, South Australia, just to pick on the, um, the chaps with the poor water quality, um, their green, their awesome, their absolute best case scenario goes from 3.9 to 5.7, which is considerably lower. If you were in Victoria and getting those scores, you would probably be looking at orange dots rather than bright green dots. And that reflects the paucity of the fauna in that part of the world. So what we've done with this banding is we're when you're getting a comparison from your site, we're comparing it to all the other data that is available in that area. And in this case, the jurisdictions that we've divided up into are simply states. Um, there's, there's arguments for and against that. This just turned out to be a, a simple way to do it, simply because the existing data sets came in from state authorities. So it, it made sense. And spatially, it actually tells a reasonable story in most instances. I mean, there's, there's cases where, you know, the New South Wales-Victoria border is, is a little bit more fluid than, say, perhaps the, uh, the, the WA um, Victoria, you know, they don't, they, they should be disjunct. So, but where anywhere where the spatial stuff overlaps, it's, it's, it's harder to argue for. Taz is, you know, quite obvious. It's, it's separate, as you guys will know, pre-plague, post-plague. Um, John, could yes. I just ask, could you please explain how the weighted average is worked out? Yep. So what happens is uh, the, I can't remember what the bins are exactly now, but if you can imagine uh, a setup where you have, if you have, say zero, one or two animals, that's called bin one, um, three, four or five animals, it's bin two, greater than seven, it's bin three and so on. And then you have basically greater than 20 is another bin. Um, what you do is you, if an animal falls into that category um, in terms of its abundance, then you use a standard multiplier for that. So if there's greater than 20, you'll multiply a thing by four. If there's less than two of it, you'll multiply it by two. I can't remember what the exact numbers are for that. But so long as you divide that back by the number of um, units, I guess, in that thing, you end up with an average. And all it does is it, it, it boosts the contribution of those more dominant, numerically dominant critters towards the to the average, if that makes sense. Um, I, uh, if you like, I can, um, there'll be a worked example we can put through later, and it makes much more sense when you're actually looking at um, the thing um, being multiplied out in real time. Um, do, 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 does it reflect um, more data in the different states? Um, probably not necessarily more data. Um, it does reflect where the data was taken in many instances, and also what the actual state's overall um, uh, state is, I guess. So Victoria, for example, you have many more kilometres, square kilometres of, of knackered landscape than we do in Tassie. So our stuff tends to be a little bit top heavy, if that makes sense. So these skews, well, I'm, well, I'm um, you know, cheekily putting up a normal distribution here, you might find that Tassie would, you know, have a, a, a lump that's probably more um, to the right of where that's showing and a longer lower tail, it's much shallower. Whereas in Vic, you might find that the lump is more to the left because of, you know, the, the, the acres and acres of rural um, and slightly different stuff that you have 
in state. So that, that is reflected in the banding and um, it does come through. I guess um, the big thing with this is that so long as it's consistent, it doesn't really matter because you're comparing, um, to use the old adage, apples and apples. So long as you're comparing with it, with, with within state um, numbers with within state numbers, you're in a fairly safe place. Um, there's, and the other thing is like once you've got the actual list of critters, you can do whatever you like with it. So if you're not comfortable with these as comparisons, you can go back and create your own. And this wasn't something I was going to talk about, but um, uh, just as an example of that, North um, North Central CMA have a fish rehab project where they basically recalculated the banding for their area specifically using quite a large data set that they have access to, which is a subset of the EPA stuff. And that gives them um, sort of a finer resolution in the way that they put their things together. And it's, it's a really nice piece of work and it's very definitely something you can do. But what I guess you do is you work with what you've got access to. So if you're in Victoria and you don't have that finer resolution stuff, the Victorian comparisons are what you would run with. Hopefully that sort of makes sense. Okay. Um, so yeah, like I just said in that last sentence. So if you are doing Victorian stuff and you're using the National Water Bug Blitz, your frame of reference is all the other sites that are in Victoria. Um, and there are many arguments for do this like there, there are obvious bioregions within the state of Victoria and I guess that's something we're going to look into down the track is we might end up with uh, a set of uh, regional um, uh, banding uh, rules that are a lot more like perhaps what the Murray Darling Freshwater Research Centre and the EPA in Victoria rolled out but at the moment our data was poor enough that we ended up having to lump it all up to state level and it, it's not all that different in the end, and it does the job, I guess, is, is, is where I'm coming from. And you can sort of tell that from, the, from the, the way the data rolls out here. Good places tend to come out looking good, bad places tend to come out looking bad, just from general knowledge. So that's um, a really rough tuning uh, uh, proof of concept, I guess, that we've rolled across the data set before we've released it. Um, you know, that said, there are obviously going to be instances where you know a river around the corner that hasn't quite come out right, and it'd be really good to chat to people about those because there's always a potential for tuning this stuff down the track. Um, I guess um, what I'd like to do with this story is not, not just give you an idea of the monitoring sort of uh, frameworks that you can put these things in, but it's to give you a bit of a feel for exactly what's available as tools from our National Water Bug Blitz mapping portal. And basically the, the, two, the three big things that are there are the, um, the maps of the ecological um, condition for Australian waterways. And, and you know, if you are in Queensland, you've got equal access to data as you guys have down south. And that's for us been quite a big a big thing. It's been awesome getting all the different state authorities' data onto the, they're not on the same maps, but into the same square on your screen, I guess. So you can um, chase them down if you want to, um, irrespective of where you are. The other really cool thing that this, this alongside that amazing spatial distribution that we've got, I guess, is really cool historical records for these things. So many of these uh, state authorities, you know, started doing stuff back in the 90s or late 80s. And so we have data uh, records reaching back that far. And the cool thing about that is if you've got a local place that you care about, you have the potential to actually go delving into the history of this place in terms of its ecological integrity, I guess. So you're looking at assessments of aquatic health from, you know, time before. And that, that can be particularly cool if you know um, that a certain impact or a certain catchment management um, uh, technique came into play or has been used from a certain date, you can look at these things and, you know, do a bit of post hoc um, uh, pattern uh, finding to see whether, you know, things changed at those, those junctures. The other thing that we've built into the, the National Water Bug Blitz mapping stuff is that we've decided, um, we, we sort of undenied about what, what the best contextual information that we could make available would be. And we undenied a little bit about, you know, nutrient data and all sorts of water quality stuff, which Water Watch runs with and definitely has for some sites. And so if you're interested in that sort of stuff, it's worth going through the various Water Watch um, groups like the Victorian Water Watch portal will give you access to some of those sorts of things. But what we decided was by far and large, most consistently in the science stuff that we've been reading um, linked to uh, poor water quality or ecological condition in waterways is basically land use. If you're in a predominantly agricultural catchment, you're going to end up with a worse um, set of critters than if you're in a overly forested landscape. And by forested, I mean the sort of, uh, as in we chop trees down and then let them grow up again and then chop them down again type um, landscape compared to if you're in a perfectly natural sort of a landscape. So all of those different um, landscape scale uses um, have wildly different and you know noticeable effects upon the critters. And so being able to see what the percentage of your catchment is that's involved in each of those uh, land uses, we thought would be one of the more useful things. And so that's that's one of the other bits of data that we've got in there. 
So I guess before you want to do any monitoring, the big thing to do is to crack open our um, website and go exploring. Um, when Rich and I talked about this talk originally, and even uh, right up until this morning, um, we were just going to go through a whole bunch of stilted slides, which were things I'd prepared earlier. But what I'm thinking now might be nice is if you chaps have a catchment that's interesting, or at least of interest to yourselves, um, if we could have a volunteer from the audience that could um, uh, offer up their local um, bit of creek. And what we'll do is we'll use the, um, the Waterbug Blitz mapping portal to do a, a sort of a quick investigation. And we'll, we'll bring you guys live on the mic. So Zero, if you could type into the chat meeting um, and offer up your, your local creek to us. Um, Mullum Mullum Creek, Don Vale, Elster Creek. Rich, you got any favorites that you know about? Um, Elster Creek might be a really interesting one. Um, so. Yeah, um, so I'm guessing, was that Kate that uh, uh, made that comment, or was that uh, Liz? Yeah, that still was Jill Sockle. Ah, okay, cool. Um, but I might uh, get Kate or Jill to talk about that. Um, so, Kate, I'm going to... Kate, if you want to try and unmute yourself, and we might try and get you into the chat to talk about it, and we might get Jill to jump in too. So Kate just made you a presenter, and where am I going, Rich? Do you know? Sure. Uh, uh, so that's around St Kilda, Elstonwick kind of area. Yep. Okay. So sorry, I can't see the chat, so um, I couldn't see the, the um, suggestions that were coming up. Sorry, uh, she's got no so, mic on her computer. Uh, sorry, yeah, Jill. Kate, yeah. Kate's got no mic on her computer, and Jill's on her phone. Ah, ah okay. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to, we, we might still look through it. Um, so if you go a little bit closer to the bay, over towards your left. Um, so that red, yeah, that dot that's just to the right of St Kilda, that might be Elster Creek. Um, that Rich, one. Elizabeth Walsh says she's on if you want. Ah, oh, awesome. All right, I'll make Elizabeth a um, presenter as well. Okay, I guess um, what I'm doing is I've, I've come in through the, um, the, the main, uh, this map here, and I've zoomed in by holding um, shift down and then drawing a polygon roughly around, um, you know, the part of the world that I'm interested in. And then that zooms us back into here. And with the scroll wheel, I can zoom in and out into this map. And one of the first things that happens is the map does this thing where it selects all of the, um, the sites that are sort of in this thing. And one of the first really cool things you get out of this is whether or not your sites have ever had mayflies recorded at them. So you can see in the, the, uh, the legend in the top right of the screen, there's all the bands. And at the bottom of it says little white dot mayflies. And so up in the north near Chadston, there's a couple of sites which really quite incredibly have had mayflies in them. Um, but then um, pretty much the rest of urban Melbourne down this neck of the woods is totally and utterly without mayflies. If I drag the world to the right, you can see that as we go into Belgrave and, you know, Emerald and up in that part, all of the dots have this lovely little white centre in them. And that's showing you a mayfly sort of uh, wall of death, I guess is probably the way to describe that, which is the outer reaches of the urban um, set up. And this is a lovely pattern. It's, it's one of those ones that's that's quite quite um, repeatable and, and happens in pretty much every every major city around Australia. Um, Mayfly death. That dot on Moorabbin Airport, is that where I'm going, Rich? No, it's a little bit higher to the north. Um, so sorry. you're looking at the Alstonwick Caulfield area, if you can go a little bit further, further up and to the left. Up and to the left. So Murrumbina, oh no, here. Mullamullam Creek. Uh, so Elster Creek is yeah, it's close to the close to the bay. Yep. Let's get that down. I wonder if it's not in our um. Database. So one of the options here is that uh, some of the WaterWatch data has not gone through. So it's possible that we're dealing with a data gap, which is something good to find. Um, and apart, okay, guess, so yeah, that's the one. That's it? Yeah, that one that you just clicked that. Um, one, yeah. The one that's near like that Armadale area. 
Oh, okay, that's coming up different. So um, Kate's saying it's not on the map. It's not up there. Okay, so it is yeah. it's a gap in our, our data. So that's... Okay, really... okay. well, Bass will go to Mullum Creek then. Which one? Uh, Mullum, yep. Mullum Creek might be a better one to go for. Mullum? Yeah, so Joe Menzies suggested Mullum Mullum Creek, which is in Donvale. Yep. So Donvale, I've, I've been out of the big smoke for a long, long time, but Donvale, I'm assuming, is out northeast? Yes. Oh, there we go, Donvale. Okay. So these red dots here would be Mullum Mullum in Donvale, and this dot up here would be Tyndall's Road, Donvale, Mullum Creek. That look roughly right. Chaps, we got a. Uh, can I get a, a yes or a no from the world out there? Uh, we've got a yes. Got a yes, cool, excellent. So, looking at this catchment, um, I have to do things like figure out which way the river's flowing. I think it's flowing north, correct me if I'm wrong, into the Yarra. Um, is that a yes? Yes and yes. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. So the cool thing about this is you've got this thing where this little green strip along here, there's um, instances where the mayflies are, are popping in and out, but otherwise it's it's fairly horrible um, pretty much most of the way through. Um, so what I would do if I'm sort of just exploring this area and assuming we sort of are interested in the whole length of the river rather than just maybe a couple of sites, is I'll put the, the map so that it's pretty much central like that. And then if I scroll down the, um, the site, you can see that most of the sites that feature on the map are there, and you can see how many times they've been sampled by the number of little red um, or whatever color is relevant rectangles on the right there. Inside each of those is the um, weighted ALT score, signal score for each of them. And the cool thing about this is you can see the trajectories over time, just looking at it at this scale. Um, the slightly non-intuitive thing that's happening here, of course, is that the leftmost um, uh, value is the most recent and this is the oldest. So um, yeah, if things have been degrading, they will start off green and go orange. So we've got them slightly the wrong way around. Um, it made sense at the time, but um, has tripped a couple of people up recently. Um, so in all of these, you can see that pretty much things have bounced around the red to orange sort of category with fairly um, good ongoing stability. So they're, they're, they're looking like they're um, pretty much consistently horrible. Um, what I might do is I'll try and pick one of these sites that has multiple years um, in it. I'm trying to find a, a Mullum Mullum Creek one. Is upstream of Tunstall Road a Mullum, Mullum Creek um, sample? Can you Joe, Joe are you able to answer that question? Does that look Mullum uh, Not sure, but nearby. Okay. Not sure, but nearby, yep. Yeah. Okay, I might zoom in more and we'll, we'll see what comes up in the, the selections. So if I go like this, and we know they're on Mullen Mullen Creek because they're, that's all I've got on screen. So those ones there, let's see if there's any of those with reasonable. So they haven't got a huge amount of time spent. That's an interesting, that, Mullen, that one looks like it might be erroneous, but we'll have to see. Um, so say we're at Quarry Road, Mitchum, like this one. There's two samples um, we can have a bit of a look at. By clicking on that dynamic link there, we get thrown into the, um, the catchment um, analysis part of this, this thing. You can see that on the left of the screen there, there's a little graph with the red dot and the orange dot standing out by themselves. The red dot is from 1994 and the orange dot is from 1995. So this is quite old data, but a couple of samplings were done. Um, you can see, um, if you can just see in that map there, if I zoom into it, oops, no, do that, John. Everybody see that if I make the map huge? You'll notice that there is a grayed out section with a, a fairly ragged blue polygon around it. That is the immediate upstream catchment for the site that we're looking at, which I think is one of these here on the and what it does is it, it snaps it to the, the, the nearest set of complete subcatchments that we have on file for the uh, uh, Geo Australia uh, catchment maps. And because it does that, it'll be a little bit ragged and it'll probably give you a little bit more than you actually thought. So if the dot is where my uh, cursor is now, it'll, it'll snap a little bit downstream of that as well, but not very much. Um, 
<clears throat> and what we've got here, I guess, is uh, that polygon is then um, analysed and the next bit, the upstream catchment land use that's spat out, gives you a feel of what the upstream catchment is like for this site. And you can sort of see why it's bright red here and quite horrible, because most of the um, upstream catchment is residential and infrastructure and urban. So it's it's horrible grey stuff um, with a, a smidgen of pastoral farming, a little bit of waste management, and I can't see it. It's so small, a very, very small fracture of natural in there. So it's it's sort of makes sense that this is going to be a, a fairly degraded site. But I hope by drilling into it, we've, we've given you a bit of a feel for how you can get this, this sort of uh, info or get access to this sort of info. If you didn't really want to end up there and you wanted to go and have a look at somewhere um, that might be a little bit more um, borderline and actually exhibit some variability, some of the more interesting sites, just if you're going browsing, um, are often on the edge where you've got some green to the left and orange to the right of them, those sorts of setups. And you'll find that in these samples, um, you'll sometimes end up with much more interesting history. So you'll have things like um, this Witten's Reserve at Wonga Park um, is currently sort of orange, but started off uh, at one stage back in 1994 as scoring quite high. So if we were to go and look at that one, just so you know what a, a long, more long-term data set looks like, um, it will actually have many more dots to play with on the little um, graph that we talked about there. And you can see there, it starts off in 94, looking quite okay. And then by 2008, it's dropped down into um, the next band down into orange, and it's held its sort of position quite consistently there between 2008 and 2013. Um, this map here is showing you the um, the catchment involved, I think. Is that right? So this is a Yarra site. It's quite a huge catchment by the look of it. I wonder if that's actually accurate, whether that's a... Sometimes the mapping stuff um, does interesting things, like particularly in flat areas, we've had a couple of interesting areas where it just explodes west, but that looks fairly catchmenty and fairly spot on. And that polygon there basically has a, a makeup like this, um, huge chunk of it's natural, there's a little bit of forestry going on, a little bit of urban, and, and to a certain extent, it's the interplay between these different land uses that is gonna be giving it its, its um, interesting history, I guess. Um, one of the tools I like to use, if I'm sort of interested in a site like this, is uh, Google Earth, if you've ever come across it. If you Once you've got this catchment polygon, if you can find a couple of landmarks and find your area in Google Earth, it's quite cool to be able to go to the historical imagery and pull out whether or not there have been huge landscape scale um, changes in land use. Um, and often you'll find you know something like someone's whisked away a forest while you weren't looking between 2002 and, um, and 2008. Little things like that tend to make these scores you know, react quite adversely and drop down but it's it's, it's um, a good a good fun um, thing to do when you're trying to sort of do a bit of detective work I guess around these patterns that are here and to a certain extent that's where a lot of the uh, the strengths in this particular database are it's, it's all about um yep here's the arrow so cool um, so it's very much um, uh, releasing your inner detective if you will um, and you want to get out there and, and basically track down as much info as you can about these these various sites so hopefully doing that i've given you a little bit of a, an insight into the, the different bits of information that you can pull out and um you might be tempted to race home after this and or stay at home after this given where you are now i say it out loud um, and maybe do a little bit of investigating and see if you can actually find out if there's historical data sets for the stuff that you care about and what your catchment looks like upstream. And that's one of the things I like about this tool here that throws out the land use, is you instantly get a feel for why things might be horrible or not. Um, if you drop down below the list of sites that are in the map there, which takes quite a bit of scrolling sometimes, depending on how far you out, how far out you are, you'll find at the very bottom of this screen, it does exist, I promise. Where am I? There is a list of all of the samples that were taken and the critters that were in them. So this is, they're currently all expanded. If I close them all up, you can see that this is a list of samples here. And if I wanted to see which animals were found in, you know, uh, 4th of March, 2010, I click on that. And this is the, the actual taxa list that was there with some pictures where they're available for the critters. If they were photographed at the time, hopefully they'll end up in here, but otherwise they'll just be stock images. Um, and you can sort of see how this sort of stuff would be uh, useful things to throw into a report if you're trying to communicate um, 
the ecological health of a, a chunk of river nearby to land care works that you and a bunch of other geezers are actually currently involved in. So it's a case of finding your way around all of this and pulling out the bits that are of interest to you. When we finally finish the reporting, which hopefully will be in the next couple of weeks, um, each of these subsections will be draggable out in some format. Either it'll be a PDF or a Word doc thing, so you can throw them into your own little personalizable reports. That's our, our um, aim anyway. Um, but that might take might take a little bit more um, wrangling than I'd originally thought. So we're still mid, we're still halfway through that process. Okay, um, so how do you go from taking this stuff, which is basically just um, random information about a spot you care about, um, how do you take that and turn it into something that's more like a, um, a well thought out, possibly scientific um, approach to monitoring something? And it, it's quite a jump to go from a single dot that changes color over time to actually uh, a dot that tells a story that um, either commends a piece of rehabilitation or condemns a, um, a set of impacts. Um, and I guess the big thing you have to do when you're putting together any of this stuff is it's a bit like the detective work. It's very much um, a case of having to imagine oneself as being forced to defend this stuff in front of a hostile audience. So whenever you're actually setting up uh, a monitoring program, it's best to try and think holes in it, if that makes sense. And probably one of the first things you might want to do is to figure out whether or not water bugs are the right thing to look at. If you're looking at an impact, for example, that is predominantly nutrient based, you might find that you would be better off looking at direct measures of nutrients in the water and a much more intensive sampling program. So, for example, if you're downstream of a sewage treatment plant, that would be one of your options, I guess, to do something like that. The bugs are probably still going to tell you a story in that particular instance, and so they might be a good one to do if you want to just do rough, uh, if, you, if you're only interested in doing six monthly sampling and getting an idea of, you know, how this catchment compares to one nearby that doesn't have a sewage treatment plant, that's sort of a comparison, that would be fine. But if you want to actually say these uh, something specific about the intensity and the, um, uh, the frequency of, you know, a release or something, you really want to be getting the right tool for the job. And perhaps water bugs aren't necessarily the right thing to be looking at. The other thing that you want to bear in mind is the fact that um, all of these dots, all of those maps, are these horribly complicated mixes of land use. You'll have noticed in um, not uh, only one of those pie charts was fully gray. Most of them tend to be, you know, have at least three or four colors going on. And so what that instantly gives you information about is the fact that there are conflicting and different patterns at play. So at any point on a river, you're potentially going to deal with five or six potential reasons for why something might be horrible. So I guess the other thing you want to talk about or you want to bear in mind, I guess, is the likelihood of, res of a response. You actually want to get a feel for whether or not um, you're going to be able to see something once you put all this effort in. Um, and I guess what I've done with the, the rest of this talk is to give you a bit of a feel for what a positive response might look like, but also to give you a bit of a heads up about what's likely to show up if bugs are being used. And it's not necessarily everything. If you're doing something like in-stream works or soft engineering, like putting in um, large lumps of wood um, that will change the geomorphology of, of a river, um, there is a potential for you to have quite a strong response in macroinvertebrates because you're basically adding and changing the habitats that are available at a site. And by doing that, you're opening up spaces or um, opportunities, I guess, for bugs to um, be at the site that weren't there previously. So in-stream works has a fairly high likelihood of a response. Fish habitat improvement um, similarly is dicking about with the um, the uh, the structure of the river and therefore has a high chance of um, creating habitat that may then be um, uh, used or utilized by um, by your, your freshwater macroinvertebrate fauna or your water bugs. Um, rehabilitation um, maneuvers like revegetation and riparian fencing, if you think about them, they're, they're sort of stepped back one more notch away from the stream. And yes, they'll do things like intercept nutrient heavy flows from you know, paddocks and what have you like that, but they are much more hands off. And so the chances of them having a, a noticeable um, response in the stream are less than the others. And I guess that's what this list is. It's as you go down towards the bottom, you could be less and less certain of a response in your stream fauna. This is my opinion based on you know stuff I've read. I haven't got any citations in here, I probably should, but I I'm just put this slide in just to give you a feel where your for where your works that you might be considering monitoring might fit. So what would a what would a response, a positive response, look like at your site? Well it probably would look not unlike this. This is Pearly Brook at Pearly Brook Road. 
And I've chosen this one basically for the shape of the line and the changing colors. Um, I've, I've done the whole bowerbird, bowerbird approach to science. It's not actually done because I know of anything on the ground. I just wanted to give you a feel for what a, a long time series with an improvement in it might look like. And what we've got here, if, if you will, is a, is a trajectory that's sort of fairly obvious, fairly pleasantly um, um, uncontroversial. Um, and on the right there in the map, you can see it's got a little tiny um, catchment most of which is, is fairly green and fairly um, in fairly good nick. Um, if you go to Google Earth like this, you can get a good feel for what's actually happened there. This is back in 2003, which is the beginning of the, where it was still orange. And you can see what's, what's actually happened here is a lot of this is um, plantation that was actually being used. This is a Tasmanian example. Um, and, and at that stage, I guess the, the, a lot of the surface soil was probably finding its way into the river. It was probably sedimentation and all sorts of things going on. And you can see what's happened over time, if you whisk forward to the current day, is a lot of that forest has actually just grown up and stabilised and is in a much better nick. The, uh, the bit, there's still chunks of this particular catchment that are being um, used for active forestry and have been logged fairly recently. But because our site is in the top left um, corner of this polygon, it's actually buffered from a lot of the, um, the unpleasantness that's happening upstream because the stream's going through the, the improved parts um, on its way to where we're sampling it. So you can see there in 2003, it was all pretty much right next door to where our site is. And then all of that sort of chunk of landscape there is sort of grown back and is nailing down the soil much, much better than it was previously. If you have a look at the land use stuff for this particular little polygon, you can see that it's exactly as you can see from the photos, it's forestry and forestry plantation. So this is a, an active, um, basically like um, large harvested area, basically. Um, and the, the plantation forestry there will will um, basically be chopped out at regular intervals. And so you can imagine this um, water quality uh, roller coaster is probably going to um, persist for the for the for the life of these these particular land uses. Um, but it's it's interesting to see. And one of the cool things about this this tool and this web tool, I guess, is that you can bounce around the landscape looking for patterns like this um, and then, you know, go looking for why, which is kind of cool. If you have a specific area that you, you um, are interested in, um, hopefully we've got the data for you. We just gave it your demonstration before of where we haven't. But um, some of the in Victoria, particularly over the next uh, month or two, we'll be getting more of the Water Watch data um, into that database. So that should get better in the in the near future. So that's how you'd look at um, a a recovery or a rehabilitated section. If you're on the lookout for um, suspected impacts and stuff, I guess what you want to be looking for is is um, you need to sort of go into the arena, I guess, thinking about what sort of an impact it is that you've got. You know, there's, there's basically two types in terms of their special distribution. There's point sources or there's diffuse things. And a point source um, would be something not unlike um, we had a, a, a paper mill uh, when I was living uh, at a different place just uh, near New Norfolk, and it would put a, a hot water um, discharge into the nearby river. That came out of a very specific pipe and it hit the river in a very specific location. That was a very discrete point source um, of, of an impact. Um, diffuse um, impacts are things more like uh, the entire urban landscape. As your river moves through it, it's um, affected in many points, as in that there'll be um, lots of little stormwater points where, where you know, it starts to interact with slightly more unpleasant um, water inputs. But overall, the change in the river is that it's a diffuse thing. Like once you hit that urban area, your water is coming from a catchment, which is like that. And so that the change is uh, incremental and ongoing and relentless. And it will just happen as you go across that, that water. And the surface runoff from immediately outside the river will be similarly tainted by the sorts of impacts that you're looking at. Once again, with an impact, you want to be figuring out whether water bugs are the right thing to look at. And that's a simple question of the ecology. Is it, are they going to respond to it? Are they losing their homes? Are they being smothered by algae? Are they being smothered, smothered by sediment? Um, is something in the, you know, the, the river life that they're used to expecting being changed to a great enough extent that they're being kicked out? Um, and I guess the other thing you've got to bear in mind when you're looking for an impact is, is the impact that you're looking for the strongest effect? So if you were going to look, for example, um, for the impacts of uh, a small urban uh, influence in, a, in an otherwise agricultural catchment, it might, the change between the um, agricultural catchment and the urban area, if it's a small town or something, might not be great enough um, compared to the, you know, the degradation that the, the agricultural landscape inflicts on the, the river in itself. And so it might not come up. So you've got to, got to be mindful, I guess, of overlapping scales of patterns. Hmm. 
John, yeah. we've got a few questions come through. Are you okay to answer those now? I am. I've been mentally ignoring them. Um, I... <laughs> so, well, first one is um, how many sites do you have with water bug data within the Greater Melbourne region? Do you know that? I don't. You'd have to have a look. Um, uh, heaps. The, 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 the map that we saw before is, is all the dots. Um, I couldn't give you a number off the top of my head, but it's 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 large. There you go. Um, where is it? Hang on, take, I'll just. So this is whether they're ongoing or not is, is a big question. So this is no, I go Victoria. And we just draw urban urban. I wish this thing, it, I'd be able to answer you if I could scroll down the side and just give you a count of these, but um, I can't. Um, but it is a large number, as you can see from the number of dots involved there. And it's pretty comprehensive in its coverage, except for the one that we wanted to look at earlier, which is not there. Um, another question, will the source of the subsampling data sets be available so people can judge degree of confidence associated with it and have an audit trail they can follow in case they use the data, have additional questions to ask the samplers. Yep, that's a good idea. Um, we have, what have we got currently? We've got all sorts of things like that in there. I'm just trying to remember if I'm... Seven hundred and ten. I saw. Seven ten. You saw. Okay. We haven't got it currently. We should have. Um, there used to be a, a, a field on this that came up with the, the data source alongside the, so this this uh, site code at the top left there is because it's taken from a specific data set that has people attached to it. So um, we used to feature it here just to the right of that, but it's disappeared. So it is something that we can do and um, we will because it does matter to people. So yes, we, we don't, but we will. Um, and we did historically. I'm not sure why it's disappeared. We shall fix it. I'll just try it off a note. Great. And um, there's a comment from Greg. Recover, recovery signal may be easier to see on low order streams um, compared to high order streams, I think that might be. Um, the big answer to that is I think it all comes down to proportions of river influence. Like if, if, if you're, uh, and I suppose it is easier to, which which answers your question, I guess. Yes. Um, so if you've got a small bit of river that doesn't have much of a catchment upstream, you've got a greater chance of um, rehabilitating the whole bloody thing um, than you do if it's an enormous catchment, I guess. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. And when you move the Water Watch bug data into this reporting system, will you use the same Water Watch site mm -hmm. codes? we will use whatever they had attached to them so you will be able to find them again. So we don't make up new stuff for them. They are the labels that they came with. And that allows, you know, if you're looking for an EPA code that you know, um, one of the, the features I, I forgot to use was, see the search at the top there? Um, if you were to type in, uh, we'll actually search through, um, and give you all the sites there, and they have their site codes next to them um, that are, those that are used by the person that did the sampling. So that's a, a quick way of pulling up um, creeks that you care about um, through those linkages there. And um, they go straight into that sort of setup there. Boop. And no dots. It's a bit interesting. No dots at all. WBB. So this is a recent data point that was put in from the app. Um, I'm gonna. I might leave that one up in the background and, and investigate that one at my leisure later. Um, do we have another question? Uh, just that Sue noticed it said 717 sites at the top of the screen before ah, previously. Okay. Does in inside the yeah yeah okay inside the map that I had selected. Cool. That's I can do it. Excellent. Thank you, Sue. Yep, that was the last question. Alrighty, I shall soldier on then. Um, we're probably close to um, wrapping up shop, uh, but I guess I'd like to finish with um, an example which 
didn't quite work out the way I thought it was going to. This is Hobart Rivulet, which is around the corner from me, but um, quite distant from you chaps. Um, and one of the simpler tools that we've been using um, for the National Water Bug Blitz is the simple presence or absence of mayflies. And I, I like to roll it out by just hopping into the river downstream where I know there aren't any mayflies and then just walking upstream in waders and, you know, rolling rocks and having a bit of a look with a net until I get my first mayfly. And at that point, I stop. Um, and that gives you a whole bunch of points. And it does that thing where we map the, um, the point where you find your first mayfly. This is the point where we found the first mayfly on Strickland, on um, uh, Hobart Rivulet. And if any of you have ever been to Hobart, you'd be familiar with the green stuff on the left there, which is the Mount Wellington Park. Um, Hobart Rivulet runs out of that into um, the thriving metropolis that is Hobart, just on the right there. Um, our towns are a bit, um, not, not as comprehensive as yours, um, so it's quite small, but we do quite a lot in quite a small amount of time. So by the time you're in the middle of town in Hobart Rivulet, it is quite horrible, um, despite us not having a very large town to throw at it. Um, but at the point where the mayflies kicked out, we had this thing where there were instantly three potential influences of, you know, or reasons that I could see for why we suddenly lost our mayfly fauna. Um, there is an enormous brewery there, which makes awesome beer. Um, there is a stormwater outlet from nearby urban areas. And then smack bang in the middle of the river, which is a strange place to put these things, but it seems to be um, a recurring pattern, is a great big confluence of um, sewage uh, pipes that come in, um, complete with overflow valves on the top of them. And it's really difficult once you sort of map this in and you've got all the different reasons for these things um, to, to figure out why it is that the mayflies are dying here. But there are plenty of reasons for it, I guess. And um, I guess this is one of those things where we need to look at the look at things in more detail before we can figure out what's happening. This is um, one of the things I forgot to do earlier. Like when you're bouncing around in the data, you can actually turn on the land use layers so you can see spatially where all the different land uses actually are mapped as being. The, um, the, the size of the pixels they use is, is quite large and a little bit clunky looking, but it's, it's, it's very up to date. This is 2018 data, 2019 data, which is fairly up to date for large data sets that you know, need to be updated by lots and lots of people. And what we've got in here is the bright red stuff is, is considered urban or you know, concrete based stuff. And the purple is nature conservation or managed resource pipe. So you've got, so basically forest around these things. And our dot, this orange dot here with the white mayfly point right in the middle of it is just upstream at the point that I was showing you before. So that's the last mayfly um, is just present there. And then as you go into town instantly, these red dots are along the rivulet. Um, and you can see it's very much on the, the fringe of the urban stuff, which fits with that observation about the stormwater. Um, and it also fits with the, the, the sewage um, lines and stuff. But there's, you know, from the information I've got here remotely, there's no, um, no way to pin it specifically on any of those particular um, sources of impact. So you need to consider whether there's all sorts of things going on and be very careful that correlation um, isn't what you've got rather than causal linkages. So just because you're um, necessarily really, 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 really anti-forestry or really, 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 really anti-dairy or really, really, really anti a specific thing, you have to be careful that just because it's upstream, it isn't necessarily the main reason that it is at fault. You can have all sorts of landscape scale things that are um, doing just as you know bad a job of being nice to the river. So you've got to be very careful with these things and use a bunch of caveats. And one of the things you can do, I guess, to, to to work on this is to explore the surrounding landscape and look for whether these patterns are bigger than just your creek. Um, and that's probably something I would recommend, I guess. Anybody got any questions? And we've got, briefly, I'm listening. We've got one. Um, how many bodies of still water are monitored? Um, the reason Marnie's asking is they're involved in uh, involved at Devil Bend and Bitten reservoirs that haven't been monitored for some time, but hopefully they will again when the Melbourne, when Water Watch team do the monitoring training. So I guess that question's about, yeah, like is there an ideal number of water bodies that should be sampled in an area or is it more the more data we can collect the better really depends on what your question is um and and i guess 
still water bodies are a different thing again. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I've been banging on about is, is very much about riverine ecosystems. The signal scores that we're dealing with work really well for rivers. They don't work so well for wetlands or, um, you know, more, more bathtub-like um, shaped water bodies, um, mainly because the sorts of critters that you get in those tend to be um, of the, the more tolerant types anyway. And so the resolution that you get in those is, is a little bit hampered by the fact that most of the critters you're getting are from the, you know, the orange and red part of that um, figure that I had up at the beginning. Um, so I wouldn't use signal scores um, to outright, no. So if you're going to use signal scores in a wetland or a water body, you have to be comparing them basically to, um, to historic data at the same place. So you can look at how stuff changes over time at the same location, but you can't really use banding to say whether something's um, impacted or not. It, it doesn't work because you're comparing it to a, uh, a set of data that was derived entirely from rivers, if that makes sense. So all the bands that we were using there would not work for um, for lakes and they would not work for wetlands. So you, you, would, you would just wouldn't use them. And in the app, I'm not sure whether we've implemented it yet, but we, we've remo removed the ability to score using the banding for wetlands and uh, other water bodies like dams and stuff. But if you want to compare it to last year's um, critters, that's fine. Or if you you know have an ongoing long-term data set, then that's really worthwhile. And I guess that's that's where this stuff is quite strong. If you are repeat sampling the same location. And is there anything being developed, the equivalent of this? Like, has anybody done any work on that that you know of? For wetlands or? Yeah, for wetlands. Um, there was an Oz Rivers equivalent for wetlands and a signal equivalent for wetlands that were put together in WA. Um, but reviews as to whether it was working or not were a little bit split. Um, so people are not sure. It's not consistently used. Um, I, I, I still always come back to that. Compare this river with its, sorry, this this wetland with itself over time, rather than this wetland with other other wetlands. Um, stuff has definitely been done, but not enough to come out with the strength of inference that you have with riverine stuff. Because there's so many dots on rivers, you can actually come up with quite a strong comment. They are each one of those dots in Victoria is a reference for you to compare your site against. Um, and we haven't quite got the same data set for wetlands or still water bodies. It, it, it basically boils down to that. So I did um, my research looking at the biodiversity uh, value of urban wetlands. So I was specifically mm. looking at macroinvertebrates. And what I did when I was anal analysing the data was comparing between sites, comparing, say, like against water quality parameters or, yeah. you know, percentage of impervious area. So... I was able to still make use of that data without necessarily having a score. So if, yeah. if that if that helps at all. Yeah, and that, that's, I guess, what you're doing there is you've got yourself a spatial um, set of references. So you're going, look, I did 40 of these, and of those, these ones went that way and those ones went that way, which is cool because you've got this, this spatial comparison that you can make. You need something like that. You either need the same dot over time or a bunch of different dots at roughly the same time that you can... Um, a bit of arm waving about but in terms of having a uh you know a, an off-the-shelf set of references to compare things to that's not really available just yet um it, it given that you know people like yourself are actually working on these things um it's probably not that far off it just isn't there currently thanks um nick olive's question there about um whether the data matches up uh we've just been working on getting the water watch portal data to uh, feature in this. Um, as we demonstrated before, quite embarrassingly, not all of it does currently, um, but the aim is that it definitely should. So it'll be like a flow. Everything goes from all the watch comes into here. Um, and that, that will be our, our, our thing to drive for. Hmm. Any other questions anyone's got? Seems to be it. Yeah. Got off quite lightly. Yes. Eh? Yes, I think um, we'll we'll check to see if any last questions come in. But we might uh, wrap that up there, John. Unless you wanted anything else that you wanted to to chat about within this presentation. Um, no, I think we're on time, and I've run out of steam. Um, so I think we're good. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, um, thank. You.
Thank you very much, John, for um, putting together this presentation and chatting with us today. Uh, some fantastic information there, and I think a lot of valuable information to help us with designing our uh, future monitoring projects, so whether we can incorporate bugs or some other things as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, and um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the presentation today. So um, it's great, great to see so many people jumping in and... Um, Looks like these things are valued, uh, and hopefully we will see more of you joining us for some of the future sessions that are coming up. So in two weeks' time, we have Bio2 Lab presenting on some stormwater um, monitoring project, uh, and then after that, we've got some sugar glider habitat um, restoration project uh, presentations coming up as well. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Rich.